Hello, welcome back, everyone. This is James Giglio with the MVP Interactive Podcast. Today, we have a great guest, Jorn Buchholz. He is the Executive Director of the National Soccer Hall of Fame. And as we'll learn, we'll hear about his extensive uh, experience in, in soccer, as well as um, other organizations. Uh, he is a seasoned professional soccer executive with over 20 years experience ranging from marketing, promotions, operations, communications, sponsorship, partnership, and a whole lot more. Jorn was the CEO of the 2011 championship winning and 2012 runner-up North American Soccer League, the Minnesota Stars FC, as well as the founder and president of Jorn SOS, a company which provides emergency traditional soccer operational needs to high-level matches, professional soccer clubs. Jorn, welcome. And I, my first question off the bat, have you been a janitor? I feel like you've done it all. I actually was a janitor in uh, in college. Okay. Um, I worked at a community college on the cleaning crew. So I've I've done my fair share of toilets and floors. Unbelievable. Well, yeah, you know, I always, going into meetings, I, I sometimes joke to break the ice to say that I'm just, you know, the, the janitor of MVP Interactive, because as a leader, I guess sometimes, you know, if you have that mindset, it's a, it's a positive one, right? You know, you, get, you keep your hands dirty. Sometimes you got to do it all to get the yeah. job done. Absolutely. Well, we'll get right into it, Jordan. We really appreciate uh, your time here. And uh, as your background indicated, <laughs> I mean, over 20 years of experience, we like to start the the podcast off with giving a little a little bit of background on on you as a individual and a uh, executive. So, you know, if you could just walk you, walk us through the journey of your career and um, you know the fact that it spans so many different roles and and years. Yeah, well, I mean, you said this podcast was twenty to forty minutes, but I could probably drone on for <laughs> longer than that on the number of places uh, I've been. Fortunately, um, you know, but I'm I'm originally from Nebraska. Grew up in a small town, uh, Hastings, Nebraska. Um, you know, my, my dad helped start the soccer program at the YMCA there. One of my earliest photos is of me with a soccer ball next to my head. So, uh, I think it was destined, uh, to, to happen and played in high school there, uh, played college at Hastings college. Um, and then, you know, when I got done with college, I didn't really know what I was going to do. So, um, you know, it was suggested, you know, did you know that you could actually potentially work in sports? So I sent out a ton of resumes to soccer teams and ended up, you know, my first job was in Indiana with the Indiana Blast, which is a minor league soccer team. Uh, I took the job of, you know, director of operations and media. I had no idea what that meant. Just went out there and figured it out. Um, started to meet, you know, some people in the soccer world, went to Minnesota um, to be, uh, you know, in marketing at the Minnesota Thunder, which was a second division team at that time. Uh, and, you know, the, the guy who was uh, the general manager of the team by the name of Jim Frostlid, I got into his office, you know, one of my early days there and said, hey, I want to be in your shoes someday. If you can keep me included on meetings, you know, that maybe you wouldn't normally do and, and things like that. And he he really, he put me under his wing. Uh, and it was just a few years later at the ripe old age of 24 that he left and made me general manager of the Minnesota Thunder, which was wow. quite a scary proposition and spent several years there. Um, left to go to Austin to work for a team there for a year, who then moved to Orlando. I went back to Minnesota, uh, worked a few more years there. And so kind of been all over Kansas City following that, Louisville, Kentucky after that, back to Austin, Texas, wow. uh, short little stint in Oklahoma City. And now uh, got lucky enough in, in 2017 to take on this job at the National Soccer Hall of Fame. And I'm proud to say it's the just this last June, it became the longest place I've been in my <laughs> career. And it actually has felt nice. So yeah, no, I, I've broken phenomenal. a record this year. Yeah. Well, that's phenomenal. Boy, a 24 year old GM. Now, uh, how close of age were you with the players at that uh, point? Many, most, most of them were older than me, you know? So that was wow. a very, that was an interesting role and one that, you know, I mean, I, I look back on it as one of my favorite roles because it really made you grow up fast, you know, sure. Sure. Uh, from sales and marketing manager to literally sitting at a coffee shop and having, uh, you know, the general manager tell me that he's taking a new job and he'd like me to be the new GM. And I just remember going back to my car and just staring at myself in the review mirror going, what in the world is happening here? But uh, yeah. but just a fantastic opportunity. And like I said, I mean, small organization, right? Four or five yeah. employees. But I mean, you're running a, wow. a a giant soccer team, you know, so it was it was a lot of fun, a lot of stress, you know, I mean, minor league soccer at that time. I mean, this is 2000 four, you know, was, it was challenging, you know, right. uh, it was, you, you would, 
you would spend all week, you know, trying to figure out, you know, between, you know, doing camps, uh, you know, selling tickets, how in the world were you going to uh, make payroll in two weeks? Uh, you know, you, you'd get through payroll, you'd celebrate. And then all of a sudden you looked at yourself and went, wow, we got to do that again in two weeks, you know, and, and try to figure it out. So, <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, it was fascinating. Well, as you were speaking, I was thinking, boy, I mean, there's a lot to relate as a small business owner and an entrepreneur. I mean, you would talk about wearing many hats and, uh, you know, two weeks has never come quicker than running payroll, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, there is no, there's no break and bills have to be paid. And uh, most importantly, your colleagues and your, um, your associates. And so, you know, that's interesting. So as a, you know, I always, we're in and around different athletes, you know, here at MVP Interactive and, you know, whether we're f producing a photo shoot or some type of experience, maybe even recording a podcast, you know, you, you don't want to group athletes all together in, in sort of one bucket, but I've noticed certain trends and behavior characteristics within different athletes. And uh, I think right there with hockey players, you have soccer players as, as being uh, generally some of the more polite and, and sort of friendly uh professional athletes. And so I'm curious to know, you know, how they sort of handled and treated you as a 24 year old GM. Um, maybe they broke that stereotype. And uh, I mean, maybe some of the older vets maybe razzed you a little bit, but talk to us you a know, little bit. About that. It, it, I mean, it, we had, we had great teams at that time from individual standpoints. I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, it was minor league soccer at the time as well. So, you know, they weren't making hundreds of thousands of dollars, sure. you know, it was, you know, it was a professional soccer team that a lot of time was a bunch of, blue collar soccer players, you know, so it was kind of this group mentality of, Hey, we're all in this together. And you know what, there, there were times where payroll was a day late, you know, and you got to go out there and talk to the team and be like, Hey, it's coming, you know, but yeah. it's going to be tomorrow, not today, right. you know? Uh, and I think, you know, there was, there was a lot of respect back and forth. You just got to be open and honest with them. Sure. You know, they're, they're individuals, right. They got bills to pay. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you just had to be, you had to be honest with them. And if you were up front, they were, they were on your team, you know, so it was, it was fantastic. Those are some of the most, you know, proud moments of my career was really that those early days of, of running the Minnesota Thunder. And I'm sure, you know, you, you had said it really forced you to kind of grow up, but I think professionally, um, you know, maybe as someone that hasn't been in the corporate world right out of school, or you're kind of getting your feet wet with your, you know, your role or your position and trying to figure out where you want to go, but you don't realize the importance or the significance of, being thrown into the fire as a, as the best way to kind of learn. And, and if you have good colleagues and support that can kind of help mentor you and um, it's an invaluable experience, right? You know, yeah, I, no, it, yeah, it really was. I mean, it was like, I mean, the first, I mean, it was, it was March, you know, of I think it was 2005 when I got promoted to general manager and the season was a month away, you know? So it was, it was drinking from a fire hose, you know, right away. You know, I mean, just things that I had never even thought about. I mean, workers comp, right? I'd never thought about that kind of stuff in my entire life, you know, and benefits for the entire organization and just uh, payroll. I mean, that's what payroll taxes, what, you know? So, uh, you know, it was just things that you, you know, I, I hadn't really dealt with before that you just had to kind of get thrown in and, and figure it out, you know, and get the right people around you from an accounting standpoint, from, you know, other managers in and around, you know, to, to really help you. But yeah, it was, again, I mean, really invaluable, you know, I mean, I, I feel lucky that that happened um, because, you know, I think a lot of people in the, the sports world is tough, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to move up. And a lot of times in order to move up, you got to move on, you know, and go somewhere else and right. which I've had to do as well. But, you know, I think in, in that happening in my career, I think it allowed me to take some, some steps, you know, from a sales and marketing manager to a general manager and maybe skip some of those executive vice presidents, you know, and like okay. things that you have to put in time with, you know, and just really get thrown into the fire. So I, I, I feel lucky, you know, that that kind of pushed my career, I think, forward in a way that I don't think a lot of people have the opportunity to have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you see that a lot in sports with um, colleagues kind of going from organization to organization and um, not to say they're as broad as your background in terms of, you know, switching departments and roles. But, you know, we've seen many times that, uh, you know, sports executives, they they sort of look to get to that particular ladder to achieve a certain title or uh, level of executive. Right. And, um, you know, interesting enough, we had another client or excuse me, a current client of ours that his background was fairly similar where he was involved in a uh, an upstart 
sports league. It was technically a professional league. And, you know, as a GM or a CEO of that particular team, he had to handle those responsibilities. But when he went back to the, you know, the four or five major teams, you know, I think he, you know, his, his sort of step back from a title or most people would see as a demotion, he was much more in his comfort level because yeah. of that experience. Right. And, um, you know, he's excelling, even though that the title isn't as sort of glamorous as, as yeah. a GM or CEO. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I get that. I mean, I went from being, you know, really what was CEO of the Minnesota United in 2012 to, which was a second division team at that time to, I took a role as director of fan experience at sporting Kansas city, which was at a major league soccer team. Um, you know, but the title was clearly different, you know, but right. that's sometimes what you've got to do when you're jumping into, you know, a league that's a step up, you know, and has got a lot more individuals around it. So, um, yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah. So interesting that you bring up Sporting KC because, um, you know, the nascent sort of popularity years, I would say, probably just about 10 years ago, right? The explosion of MLS here and the expansion of different teams. I, I do recall uh Kansas City has been one of the more forward thinking organizations when it came to fan experience. So this is a nice surprise that, you know, you were the guy behind the curtain there, right? Yeah, a, a little bit, you know, I mean, I was there for a little bit less than two years because I ended up taking a, a job in Louisville, Kentucky. But, um, you know, when, when I went there in 20, pretty sure it was 2013, um, the fan experience there was great. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I can't take credit for for building it. You know, I, I, I came in to just kind of put maybe some extra touches on top of it to make it just even better. Um, and, and that was really my goal there. They again, like I said, amazing fan experience built by many people before uh, my time there. But, you know, I mean, it helps when you've got a shiny brand new stadium like they did, you know, that was only a couple of years old in Sporting Park at the time. And um, but yeah, that was that was a fun opportunity for me and, and my first real opportunity in the big leagues. Yeah. Yeah. So of all the roles, I mean, you've had them all, including janitor. And again, you don't have to speak to an organization. We'll keep, we'll keep it fair and friendly, but putting you on the spot here of all the roles that you've held, I mean, would you, would you be able to kind of rank them in terms of what was your, your most favorite to maybe your least favorite? Yeah. Well, yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, I think, you know, I hold near and dear to my heart, all of my time I spent in Minnesota. Um, you know, that was a, it was a fantastic time. It was a challenging time at times. And we had multiple different ownership groups. Uh, very infamously, we've got an ownership group that kind of disappeared, uh, you know, at the end of 2009 and left the organization high and dry. And many of us hadn't been paid in months, right. uh, you know, so, um, but then, you know, I, I, I left in 2010 and I, I, I had an opportunity to go back there in 2011 when it was a league owned team, the league had come in to step in and take it over, but the league was like, Hey, we can't do this forever. You know, we need somebody to come in and help us run this ship. Uh, I, I, I equated a little bit sometimes to like flipping a house, you know, like it was a team mm -hmm. that was struggling fan base, you know, it was struggling and kind of, I felt like, you know, the team that we brought in kind of came in and, we put new shutters on it, you know, and we painted the house and uh, we just kind of got lucky in the 2011, we won the championship, you know? So I say we kind of won, you know, the best yard on the block, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> award, you know, that put a lot of eyes on us. I mean, we were the, we were the, we were a league owned team in 2011 and wow. had probably the smallest player budget and went out and won the league. Uh, right. And then the following year, you know, lost in penalty kicks in 2012 and, it was really that 2012 season that, you know, kind of got the eye of a gentleman by the name of Bill McGuire, who was the former CEO of United Healthcare in Minneapolis. Okay. Um, and he ended up, you know, purchasing the team uh, that fall of 2012 um, and has brought it to where it is today, took it to Major League Soccer, um, you know, with other investors. And, you know, so I, I'm really fond of that experience in that, um, you know, being able to, you know, with the team that we brought in and the fans, being able to kind of save that team if you will because it was on the brink of going away right uh, you know and to be able to to you know ensure the long-term viability of that organization is probably you know i i think you'll talk to a lot of people that were involved at that time probably one of our proudest moments um so that was i've got a lot of fond memories from there um i love my time at kansas city you know it was shorter than you know i maybe wanted it to be just because i got i got an opportunity in louisville kentucky um mm -hmm. and went there but um 
you know, this one for me at the National Soccer Hall of Fame is probably ranked right up there with Minnesota as well. Um, something completely out of my wheelhouse. You know, I you, you look at my resume. I've never worked at a museum, if you will, you know, but um, this one really spoke to me, though, because, you know, the Hall of Fame had disappeared in 2010. It was used to be up in Oneonta, New York, it went away. Um, you know, and there was like, there was these discussions about bringing it back online, bringing back a, you know, a brick and mortar building. And I just thought, God, what a great opportunity to come in and put a stamp on something. And again, you know, try to try to ensure that long-term viability of an organization. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a soccer guy, you know, and a lot of the people, the men and women that are enshrined in this building are my heroes, you know, so being able to, you know, finally bring a hall of fame back online a place for them to celebrate you know their careers and um you know i mean it's, it's a passion play as well you know to be able to create something for them because at the end of the day watching all of those individuals play uh is brought me to where i am you know in, in my career so I, I i felt it was a way to to really give back to those individuals as well so yeah. this has been this has been a really really fun one and like i said something completely out of my wheelhouse, um, you know, but it's got a lot of great support in U.S. soccer, in the Hunt family, the city of Frisco. I don't have to worry about payroll every two weeks <laughs> to be there, you know. So it's that more sounds like a dream. On, that yeah, it's great. Like dream. Yeah. So it's mostly just focusing on making just a, a fantastic experience here at the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, how fortunate, I guess we can say this for both of us uh, on your behalf, but to be able to work in an industry and a profession that you had mentioned passion points, not only as a fan, but, you know, bringing that pleasure and, and passion to the the folks that, you know, attend the museum. And, uh, you know, if there's anyone that knows soccer, it's clearly you. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I can share your uh, fortunateness, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, I, I tell people when I was interviewing for this job, and, um, you know, there was a lot of a lot of people in the room, U.S. soccer, I mean, the Hunt family, wow. uh, you know, Jimmy Smith, who's the CEO over here at FC Dallas. And I, I, I give them a lot of credit. And I, I mean, selfishly, I think they made the right decision. But, you know, they could have gone the path of, hey, let's hire a curator, executive director, somebody with a museum background, and then have them try to tell the story of soccer, teach them the soccer side. Right. right. Um, and what I loved about what they did is they actually did the opposite approach. You know, they went out and found somebody who was passionate about the sport of soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, then, hey, let's have that person learn about the curating components of running a museum. And I, I, I give them a lot of credit for that because they could have gone the other way. And I, I don't know how that would have worked out. You know, it, I mean, it could have been fine. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the passion for the sport um, and then learning the other pieces to make sure you can tell it correctly um, preserve things accurately. You know, I, I think those are all things that can be learned. Um, but I think it's hard to find the right people with the right passion to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's amazing to hear from, you know, their hiring decision and that's the, that's the approach they eventually went to. But I think that maybe give yourself a little bit of credit in the sense <laughs> that your background from the executive standpoint and running a team, you know, even if they needed someone to kind of take a look at the museum from a P&L perspective or an operations mm -hmm. perspective, like, you know, that's not the, quote, easy part. I mean, it's it's arduous. It's difficult. And it's a t different part of your brain yep. <laughs> than, than being a fan or, or bringing in the the, the passion. So, uh, yeah, I really actually love that story in terms of them kind of flipping the script on that. Yeah, I, th I thought it was really cool. And I, and I think they made the right decision, you know, and yeah. I think it, yeah. I think it plays out inside this building when you come in you can tell that soccer people put it together uh, and and figured out how to do, do how to do the museum part yeah you had mentioned a couple of ownership groups and uh you know it's one of the things working in and around sports from once being a fan to now being a counterpart in the industry is that you know despite the player salaries despite the the billion dollar valuations a lot of these organizations are really just family owned businesses right and some Absolutely. some families are better than others <laughs> and so um you know i think the passion of the ownership too really comes to play with how successful organizations not not not, not always but you know if you look back and think of all of the owners that are in the news or you know the ones that are famous or infamous it's because they did carry that level of passion and their organizations were successful um i'm just calling back that experience in minnesota where it sounded like ownership from that perspective disbanded the team or um i was not aware of that but can maybe talk through us like that must have been you know very difficult and whatever happened i mean if they just kind of 
pulled a uh, 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 the oh, geez, I'm, the I'm, I'm, the uh, the name is is escaping me, but the uh, the guy that left the Browns and went to Baltimore, like in the middle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, yeah. Art, it was Art Rooney. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, it was you know in Minnesota, I mean, we had several different ownership groups, and you know we we had an individual who was originally from St. Paul who lived in Belgium, a real estate developer. Uh, came in and bought the team, you know, um, and, you know, was into it for about a year. And then, you know, just to, I, I don't think the financial backings were actually there behind the scenes, uh, which became, you know, very apparent and, you know, just kind of not, I wouldn't say skip town, but just stop. Like, hey, money's coming to help pay for this. And it never did, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, this is out there, but, you know, in 2009, you know, we were we had made the playoffs. Uh, we didn't have money to pay for the playoff tickets. Uh, so guess who, guess who put $50,000 on his credit card to pay for the team to go to Puerto Rico. Uh, you're looking at him. Wow. Uh, just because I was like, I can't be the general manager, you know, that didn't send his team to a playoff game. So sure. I did it and never got that money back. You oh, know, geez. that's, that's been written about, you know, but um, so that's not, that's not a secret, you know, that that's out there, but you know, that was, that was, that was tough times, you know, uh, to, to get through that. And you, you know, you learn from it, you know, I'll never do that again. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> well, I hope American Express or Chase or whomever, Bank of America, whoever you worked with was uh, yeah. fair. And <laughs> yeah, we, we, we settled, but it certainly, uh, it certainly hurt. So, yeah, 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 I can imagine. Well, well, I'm sorry that, that you went through that personal experience. I can certainly relate to it as, again, as a small yeah. business owner, but um, yeah, you but, but then, yeah, but yeah. but then you come to you come to a place like this, um, you know, with FC Dallas, because you know the the National Soccer. And we'll talk about this maybe a little bit. The National Soccer Hall of Fame is built into the stadium where FC Dallas plays. Oh. We're two different organizations, um, you know, but we take up the South End is where the Hall of Fame is, you know. So, but the Hunt family, uh, Dan and Clark Hunt, you know, they also own the Kansas City Chiefs. Lamar Hunt, I mean, one of the most famous sports people of all time. Um, you know, when you talk about that family business component, I, mean, I remember my first month here, I mean, you know, I made it important to go around and just talk to, you know, employees that worked for FC Dallas and I'd go down and sit and down and talk to someone and be like, okay, so like, how long have you been here? And the numbers I was hearing was like 10 years, 12, 14, 25. And I was like, what is going on? That, that to me, that was completely abnormal in the sports world, you know, sure, it really and is. now that I've been here longer than any other place I've been in my career, I get it. You know, it is a family. It is a family organization over there. Dan Hunt is in the office every day. He's a great guy to be around. You can pop into his office. So, um, you know, it's just, it's been really great to see and just the passion they have for this sport, uh, for the sport of football, for really all sports. Yeah. Is, is is phenomenal to see and, and the support of the family has been nothing but astonishing so uh so i get it and yes yeah. family organization that is this place through and through that's fantastic and and let's talk about the sport a little bit you know in 20 plus years you've seen a complete transformation of you know fledgling leagues to you know the growth of mls and you know the popularity of um the uh, olympic national teams and now you know women's sports and women's national team and and the success that they've had in they've had, you know, maybe talk to us about, you know, what you've seen the ebbs and flows in terms of trends, the growth of soccer, and then where you see the future. Yeah. Um, it's been really interesting to, to watch, you know, I mean, really since MLS, I mean, I was in my college house watching the first MLS game, you know, in 1996, I believe, you know, um, and, and just seeing how it's grown since then. I mean, it, you think back about, you know, in, in 2000, I mean, this league, major league soccer had a major, you know, issue, you know, right. owners, you know, wanted to fold the league because it wasn't working. And the Hunt family s stepped up, you know, Robert Kraft, uh, I think the Cronkies, uh, a few other people stepped up and basically we're each taking over like two or three teams a piece. And, you know, you, you talk about the growth. I mean, back then, you and I could have in 2000 during that meeting, you and I could have bought a major league soccer franchise for $5 million. Wow. $5 million. Wow. And now what we're 23 years later and they're selling for, I, I can't, I don't even remember what the last one was 500 million. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of LAFC, million, right? Like even yeah, I mean, one of the newer teams, how many, yeah, just like millions. crazy. You and I could have sold our team for, a quite a return. So that just right there shows you 
the amount of, of growth in the league. And then you've got the, you know, the women's league NWSL that had, you know, prior to that had gone through a lot of iterations, WPS and was struggling. And now I think they've really found their foothold and been around for, for years. And, you know, you just, you, 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 you think about the excitement that this country is going to have over the course of the next three years when it comes to, uh, to soccer in this country, I mean, you got a world cup in 26, you've got, Copa America coming next year. You got the club world cup coming in 2025, maybe a women's world cup coming here in 2027 or 2031. I mean, just the excitement is just, it's, it's just out of control. And there's just so much opportunity for, for soccer in this country right now, you know, and it's just, it's been phenomenal to see. And it's, it's not going away. It's only going to continue. Yeah. And you know, you're thinking about this, this trend now I'm thinking of Messi and maybe, Mm -hmm. um, you know, other international players before him where, you know, understandably they may be at the August of their career, you know, from a peak standpoint, and then they come to the MLS and they still are able to dominate. And, you know, I think Messi is an outlier despite, you know, any of them. Right. But do you see that trend changing to where international players are more enticed because of the forefathers, if you will, of uh, coming over to the MLS? I think absolutely. You know, I mean, I remember when, you know, when Messi was signing here and people were saying, well, you know, it's the end of his career and this, that, and people have such short memories. I mean, it was less than a year ago that he (laughs) took his team and won the world cup and won the best player of the tournament, you know, less than a year ago. You can't tell me that guy's on the downward slide of his career. He's got several good years left in him, but I I, I do think that is a trend that's going to start happening. I mean, and, what better player to set the trend than, than Messi, you know, yeah. um, we've seen them over the years. I mean, David Beckham came, he was not at the end of his career, you yeah. know, he played what at the galaxy for five years and then went on to play at AC Milan for a couple, you know, so that wasn't the end of his career. And you've seen some other big names, Thierry Henry, you know, he came here and played several years, um, you know, so, but I, I, I think, you know, now that, I mean, you look at the, you know, the kind of money that a Messi, you know, is going to be making here. I think other players can look at that and go, wow, this, this league can now support players like that to, to come here in the prime of their career. And I think teams are going to start going after them because you're going to have to, to compete with your neighbor down the road. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, what's smart too, with that deal with, um, with Beckham and Messi, you know, with, as it relates to Miami is, you know, maybe the younger generation as they are a little bit more business savvy than some are some other athletes um, in the past where, you know, they can look at the opportunity as less of, okay, well, I can make a little bit more maybe for a Saudi league or, you know, a, the premier league, but you know, there's real equity stake and, and there's, yep. there's whether it's sponsorship, whether it's real equity and ownership, you know, I think that is, that's something that from a business perspective, I think younger generation can really, really dig into. Yep. I absolutely agree. And I think that, you know, that's something that this league is innovative about, you know, I mean, with Beckham, um, you know, I mean, part of his deal for coming here was in the future, he'd have the ability to, you know, buy a franchise for $20 million. Well, how long has Miami been around now? Like four years, maybe, yeah. you know, and he got it for 20 million. And well, four years ago, franchises were going for hundreds of millions of dollars, you know? So uh, what an investment for him, you know, and, and his group in that, in that equity component. And then you bring the best player in the world over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's crazy to, too, to think that a, a, a market like Miami wouldn't have a, a popular team at one point. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the museum a little bit. Admittedly, I um, unfortunately have not been to the museum personally. Um, I, I think I mentioned before the show here that I do have family nearby. So it gives me mm-hmm. another excuse to to head down to Frisco and um, check out the museum. But maybe talk us through, you know, what fans and visitors can expect by what that experience is. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, there used to be a Hall of Fame uh, that closed down in 2010. But induction ceremonies were still happening. You know, they would, U.S. soccer was running them. They would happen at a in the parking lot of a San Jose Earthquakes game or something like that, but there wasn't a home. So it was really about 2015 that U.S. soccer, uh, the city of Frisco, the Frisco Independent School District, and the Hunt family got together to figure out how to bring this thing back online. And what ended up happening was really a $60 million investment into the south end of Toyota Stadium. Um, you know, the stadium's been here since 2005. Uh, you know, this has given it kind of a new shiny front, if you will. Um, but, you know, there was an important piece, you know, and, and, you know, I know we keep using the word museum because people relate to that. But I remember when I came into the stadium for the first time, 
I'd gotten the job and I looked down at the south end. I called it the National Soccer Hall of Fame at the time because it was just a big <laughs> hole in the south end of the stadium. But it did say there, you know, future home of the National Soccer Hall of Fame Museum on the south end. And I was just looked at it and I was like, God, I feel like we need to get rid of that word museum, you know, because sometimes, you know, that to me, that seems like something I don't want to do when my grandparents come to town, you know, is go to the museum, you know. Uh, so we kind of got rid of that word and we've kind of taken it out and we we call ourselves the National Soccer Hall of Fame Experience. Now, you got to back that up, right, if you're going to be experienced. So, um, you know, certainly we've got over 400 artifacts in here that tell the history of the game. But I think one of the most important things we did uh, is we partnered with a company by the name of NEC. Uh, and NEC has gone in and provided us with facial recognition to use inside of the building. So what that means is when people come in, we've got some tablets set up for them. Uh, you know, we ask them if we can take their photo. 99% of people do, because right when we brought this online, this old iPhone decided to come out with uh, facial recognition and it kind of became the norm. So the timing was perfect. But um, people come in, uh, we take their photo, we ask them where they're from, their favorite soccer teams in this country, uh, their fan level. Am I new to soccer? Am I a super fan? And their favorite soccer positions. And then based on that, when they go into the experience, there are 13 audiovisual experiences that recognize them when they walk up to it and give them information that we think is going to be most interesting to them based on what they put into their registration. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, no two people have the same experience inside of the Hall of Fame, uh, which is why we've coined ourselves the most personalized experience in yeah, sports. That's awesome. uh, yeah. And I think we can back that up and people come in and if you go up to the Hall of Fame wall where you know, all of the Hall of Famers live inside this AV. You walk up, your picture comes up, you push on your uh, your photo. Uh, and hey, for me, like it'll it, it'll put a recommended list out of Hall of Famers that are from Nebraska and that played forward. And, you know, that, uh, you know, are from my, you know, or played on some of my favorite teams. You know, it suggests Hall sure. of Famers to you that we think are going to be most interesting to you. So it's 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 a fascinating building. Um, you know, the challenge is how do you keep pushing the envelope, you know, on, on things and where do you get funding to push the envelope, you know, which is a big discussion we're having right now on sure. what's next for the Hall of Fame. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a really phenomenal building. And I think it was so smart to build it inside of an active, sta active stadium. Uh, I think a lot of times Hall of Fames are in standalone buildings, you know, in right. a town right. and they probably at times I'm sure they struggle, you know, because but, you know, at the end of the day, in the Hall of Fame, we don't pay rent, right? It, yeah. We're included in the stadium bill, you know. Well, geez, what a great number to not have to cover on a monthly basis, yeah. uh, you know, so we can think about, uh, you know, what are really the things that are going to drive ticket revenue. So, yeah, uh, that's really great. It's, um, you know, we work with the Green Bay Packers and and actually with their Hall of Fame division as well. And so that's one of the other few uh, Hall of Fames or museums that are are built into the stadium there, which which is great. And so it's um, you know, it's great to hear that the technology piece was um, a driver for you guys, and that really does you know, again, we see this from a very <laughs> focused lens as a technology company, and you know, so it's always nice to hear that um, uh, lifestyle centers, if you will, really leverage that to the best of their capabilities and you know when we talk to other hall of fames or museums it's you know they're nonprofit, and so budgeting and and funding is always a a particular issue when it comes to technology because granted it's it's not the most you know it, it comes with a price tag right and okay. so how do you how does your organization sort of handle like what's hot like wh wh where do you really say okay this is a, a nice to have or some must have and walk us through that yeah um you know we, we've been open for almost five years now, um, you know, from a technology standpoint, we haven't made a ton of changes yet um, from an actual, like call it hardware perspective. Right. Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about what's next, you know, looking at, you know, new technologies out there. So, um, you know, like I said, we, we haven't made a ton of changes yet. We make our, we make our annual changes, you know, things we need to do. I mean, keeping current with new teams coming in and, um, you know, new inductees going in and things like that. But it's, we're really at the point right now where, you know, I've, I've put together a strategic plan for the board last year to really have us look forward to the next 10 years. What does this place look like? And then, you know, figuring out how to come up with the funding for that, you know, is it a fundraising campaign? Do we come out with 
trying to push to get an endowment in place for the Hall of Fame. So we've got, you know, a budget on an annual basis to do things. So all real discussions that we're having right now um, and to think about really what's next. Because like I said, we've got we've got the biggest sporting event in the world coming here in three years. And we need to right. we, need, we need to showcase ourselves during that tournament. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing to see that, um, you know, Dallas or, you know, general greater Dallas area being uh, next to the other incumbents in terms of where the uh, the committee was looking to uh, to put these games. So that's awesome. So yeah. on that note, uh, you know, I think I was in Frisco maybe four or five years ago, maybe six years ago at the National Sports Forum. Um, mm-hmm. And at that time, you know, there was just amazing construction going on there. It, it just seemed like, okay, something's happening here not quite sure what it was, but there was a baseball stadium. There was something else being, there was an esports facility being built. You know, the, the hall of fame obviously is there. So talk to us about, you know, sort of the growth of that area. Yeah. I mean, even since the time that I've been here, which is six years now, I've just seen the incredible growth, you know, when, when the stadium went in, I mean, people tell me stories over there when this Toyota stadium went in, in 2005, I mean, it was, it was pastures. There wasn't a tollway, uh, you know, the road out front here, you know, that now sees like 250,000 cars a day, um, you know, was just a two lane, you know, kind of, you know, side road uh, mm-hmm. and think about, you know, what that is now to north of us, you know, I mean, Dallas is south of us, north of us. I mean, you just keep driving up the tollway and it, it it's like the communities never end. Uh, the PGA has moved right in up the street. Uh, got a big giant facility up there. The Cowboys are just down the street with their, with the star, with their practice facility. Uh-huh. I mean, it's really just incredible to see, you know, my, my favorite grocery store, HEB just moved in over here. Uh, that's never been this far North before. So uh, it's just really incredible to, to and see. That the sounds growth. like a new sponsorship opportunity. Right yeah, here. They already <laughs> sponsored the team. Oh, okay. over here. Yeah, so I mentioned that, but, but yeah. truly <laughs> like the greatest grocery store ever, by the way. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just been, it's been phenomenal. To, to see the growth and, and, and it's not stopping anytime soon. I mean, Toyota's down the street, right? I mean, right. It's, just, it's phenomenal, you know? And so I, I think about when Lamar decided to put the stadium here, people thought he was probably a little bit nuts, you know, sure. but now you look around and just uh, like, it's kind of its own city, you know, and the other sure. cities around it. I mean, the apartment buildings, I mean, there, there's enough people probably within a, a four mile radius to fill this stadium 10 times, you know? Right. So um, right. it's, it's just, it's, it's incredible to see what's and going it's, on. It's constantly Ray ranked pretty high in terms of quality of life, affordability, yep. happiness, all of that good stuff. Although whether, whether it's funny, this is just pure anecdotal, but that trip that I made, I think I landed, it was it was uh, 30 degrees. It was hail. But by the time I left, it was 90 degrees yep. <laughs> in yep. February. Yep. That's how, that's how, that's how we roll here right now. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Jordan, this was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for, for taking the time of your busy day. Um, you know, we like to give our listeners an opportunity to stay close with our guests. So whatever you're comfortable with in terms of social profiles or where people can reach out to you, please disclose that. And um, I'll let you get on your way here. Yeah, of course. So if anybody wants to follow the national soccer hall of fame, you know, our handles across all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, all of them are at soccer H O F. Uh, and then I'm also available on Twitter, which is just my full name, Jordan Buchholz, D-J-O-R-N-B-U-C-H-H-O-L-Z. So come on out and give us a follow and come visit us here in Frisco. All right. Fantastic. Well, that's another episode, everyone. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Enjoy.